Welcome to Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. In this podcast, I chat to athletes, coaches, and industry professionals about their sporting journey and the lessons they've learned along the way. Guests range from Olympians to the everyday lover of sport, but the message stays the same. There is so much more to sport than what meets the eye. Make sure you hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts or follow on Spotify so you don't miss the release of each new episode. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. I'd love to hear from you. I can't believe we are 10 episodes into season two. I'd just like to take a quick minute to thank our guests for sharing their journeys and every single listener who's tuned into these conversations. Last week, the podcast hit a little milestone in terms of downloads, and it just makes me feel so grateful that I have this opportunity to share with you some amazing journeys. Today, we are joined by Isis Holt, who is not only an absolute ray of sunshine, but wise beyond her years. Isis has an athletic resume that speaks for itself, having achieved nine world records by the time she was 17 years old in the 100 and 200 meter T35 sprint. Isis takes us on her journey as to how she got involved in athletics and how her career as an elite athlete took off. Whilst her accomplishments on the track are beyond incredible, it's her attitude towards sport that I love the most. Let's get into today's episode. Hello Isis, how are you today? Hi, I'm great, thank you. That's good, thank you so much for coming on, I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me, I'm super keen to be here. (laughs) <laughs> so you were <laughs> joining us from Brisbane doing a virtual recording, which is very, very exciting how great technology is. Gotta love Zoom. It's been very <laughs> handy for the last 12 months. <laughs> yeah, it's been about 12 months now, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been forever. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your sport and how you got into it? Yeah, so I do athletics. I'm a sprinter. I run the 100 and 200 metres. I I guess I first got into athletics through school, actually. I would have been in grade six, I think. And I started just in the school athletics program. It genuinely just started off as a hobby and like something to do during the week. I'd always kind of been involved in some form of sport and it was just, you know, what I wanted to do. And then when I was probably 13, so probably towards the end of year six, start of year seven, my coach at the time, who also ran the athletics program that I was in, asked me if I wanted to try racing. And of course, my first response was absolutely not. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I was terrified. I was like, I don't want to come dead last. I don't even know how it works. And also because I have cerebral palsy, I would have been running as a para-athlete, which was also completely foreign to me. So it was a pretty new, a new world for me. But anyway, He managed to convince me (laughs) and I ran one of my first races then when I was 13 and qualified for nationals that year. So from there, I guess everything happened really, really quickly. So at nationals, I qualified for the Parathletics World Championships the following year, which were in Doha. Yeah, the following year I was 14 and went to my first world champs. It was my first overseas trip, my parents' first overseas trip. So it was, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty crazy. And then at the World Champs, I broke my T35 100 meter world record and T35 200 meter world record. Yeah, from there, I qualified for the Rio Paralympics the following year, where I was uh, 15. And then the London World Champs after that, and then the Com Games, and now Tokyo. So yeah, it's been a pretty crazy couple of years, but it's been very exciting. Yeah, what an incredible career and resume that you have behind you and you're so young and it's <laughs> so amazing. Before I dive into that, those amazing achievements, I want to know what was it about athletics that drew you to it? Was there a specific moment that you thought this is for me? Yeah, absolutely. I think there are a couple along the way and a few that I probably didn't realise until quite a bit later. Initially when I started, I genuinely just liked the environment. I loved the idea of having a little squad to train with who kind of you all support each other but you're all kind of doing your own thing which I think for me it took the pressure off a little bit because you know you're very much in your own lane kind Mm -hmm. of working on yourself which I really liked I think the moment I realized that I was really passionate about it wasn't actually until (laughs) 
probably 2018 uh, when I took some time off and I took almost two years. So initially I was just going to take 2019 to finish high school and do year 12. And then, yeah, towards the end of 2019, I was sort of like, ooh, you know, like everyone was kind of figuring out what they wanted to do with their life. And I was like, I kind of miss, kind of miss the running thing that I was doing which really surprised me because, you know, it had been a pretty busy couple of years. And when I took that time off, I was fairly certain that it had kind of run its course, (laughs) pun intended. Um, (laughs) And then, yeah, I just realised that I really wanted to get back into it and it was something I just couldn't really leave alone. And then, yeah, I made the decision to um, give another go and moved up to Brizzy and I think it was probably the best decision I ever made. So, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. And I really like the fact that you've come from, I guess, running and sprinting. It's an individual event, but the thing that you really liked about it was the fact that you had a squad there behind you to help maybe spur you on in those hard moments. But then at the end of the day, your performance didn't matter to their performance and you were comparing yourselves to each other, but you weren't really relying on each other. Yeah. I came from a swimming background and it was very similar. Like you were in the same lane and you trained together and you were, you know, there every day doing the hard work together. But at the end of the day, like you run your own race and you get what you put in. And I think, yeah, that's really awesome that you found the same thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that was like one of the biggest things. And funnily enough, during the lockdown, I was training in Melbourne um, alone and I didn't realise how much it kind of took to, you know, self-motivate and get yourself through sessions and I'm quite happy training alone but then once I moved up here and was back with the squad again I completely forgot how nice it is to have that support around you and as you said like you're not relying on each other to get you to a certain point but that support that you have kind of helps get you there individually which yeah it's a good feeling. Yeah yeah and it's it's nice to be in an individual event but also have that teamwork frame behind you as well. Definitely it's a good loophole. (laughs) (laughs) And so you took a break, a two-year break in 2018 to 2020. So you're doing your final years of high school with that time? Mm, yeah. So I ran at the Commonwealth Games in 2018, like mm-hmm. early 2018, and then took the rest of that year and then did year 12 in 2019 and then started uni at the start of 2020. And when you were doing year 12, did you stop running altogether or were you still like training but just not competing? Yeah, anyone who knows me will know that I, um, I'm a bit of a nerd. So <laughs> when year 12 came around, I was like, this is like, this is my new athletics kind of thing. I was like, we're going to put that to the side and I'm going to invest everything into this. I was probably the most annoying person to be around that entire year. But yeah, that was kind of the plan. Like, I think for me, like school, uni, all that kind of stuff, that's on par for me with my athletics my training my competing I really can't pick one over the other so it was important to me to have that year to really I don't know do it justice you know the way I saw it I was like I've got one chance to get this right might as well so (laughs) that's what I did and then towards the end of year 12 when I knew that I'd have a little bit more time and flexibility and um, I had the grades that I needed to do whatever I wanted to do at uni it meant that I kind of had more choice which Mm -hmm. is all I really wanted at the end of the day just options. Yeah, I really like that. And it was actually some advice. Who was it? Oh, Ali Cole. She um, used to train where I trained and I asked her, I was struggling doing year 12 and trying to swim. And I was like, what do I do? And she said, well, you know, you can always swim after year 12. Like just, you know, it's only got one chance at year 12. Do year 12 justice, swim as much as you can around it, but you've only got one shot and to focus on your studies and the opportunities that opens up later. So I really liked that you had that as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's hard to find like that balance between the two. So yeah, having like the mental space to step back from one to help the other, I think is important. Mm, and it's it's a good lesson like to prioritize early in life. Like you're only 17 when you're making those choices. And I think that's a really wise choice that you made. Thank you. <laughs> now let's talk about your milestone. So your first world champs was within a year of you starting competing is that right yeah pretty much wow and how old were you at the first world champs I was I was 14 (laughs) oh my gosh how do you go not only like making it onto an Australian team at 14 but also then 
representing your country at that age? It was pretty funny, I think, because I <laughs> I was so naive to all of it. I genuinely didn't, I didn't really know what I was kind of doing. And I think in a sense that made it a lot easier. There was no pressure. There was no expectation that I had from others or on myself because I didn't, we didn't really have anything to base it off of. So for me, like going away with that first team was incredible. Like the support that I got from my family, my coaches and and the team itself, it is genuinely, it's like a family environment and everyone just kind of took me under their wing and I felt very supported and very, you know, encouraged to just do what I wanted to do and run fast. And yeah, I did that with some interesting fashion choices, but <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> Are your fashion choices, I was reading some articles yesterday and <laughs> is it the knee high compression socks? Is that what you're referring yeah, to? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> What's um, the story behind yeah. that? Um, well, I <laughs> I think, well, first of all, the compression side of it, there is actually a reason. I um, I find that I run better with compression gear just because for me, fatigue is a really big thing with my disability. Uh, I guess like the faster we run, the further we run, the harder it is to kind of have really good body awareness. So mm-hmm. as that fatigue sets in and you get that kind of sense of um, loss of control, the compression kind of helps to feel where you're at in space. So That was the reason for the socks initially. But then when I was, yeah, 14, I found bright pink compression socks and thought they were the best thing that had ever been invented ever. So I um, I started wearing them with my uniforms, which at the time were Vic uniforms. They were blue. It didn't look that bad. It wasn't too jarring. I There's one photo from my first nationals or second nationals where I've got one blue sock and one pink sock. And then one of the other girls in the relay has a pink and a blue sock on the opposite legs. Anyway, so the socks became a thing. And then in Doha at the World Champs, we obviously the socks had to had to be there. It was a big moment. And so instead of deciding to maybe, you know, wear the like the short shorts and the crop and some green socks, I thought, no way, I'm going to wear the long shorts, <laughs> the crop, and bright pink socks and <laughs> funnily enough green gold and pink not the best combination <laughs> but that's all right you live and you learn <laughs> <laughs> but you know what you like you look back and you're like oh that's what I did when I was 14 when I was 13 I wore I think it was my birthday party I wore this beautiful white dress my mum will remember this because she yelled at me for it and then I wore rainbow toe socks beautiful mm. Yep. So I'm um, I'm with you with the with the weird fashion choices when you're younger. Yeah, it's all in the socks. It's all in the socks. <laughs> it is. Yes, it is. So that was the first World Champs. Where did that take you? Was that Doha? Yes. Yes, yeah. and then we qualified for the Rio Games. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So the following year, um, in 2016, were the Paralympic Games in Rio, which were really different, I think, to my first World Champs. Obviously, I was going in with, you know, there was an expectation that having broken the two world records the previous year that I'd do the same thing Mm -hmm. at a Paralympic Games. It was kind of like everyone's like, oh, that's kind of the whole point. But obviously, I was at school at the time and I was still pretty young. So I was dealing with a lot of like school stuff that mm-hmm. all like 15 year olds deal with and then also trying to sort of juggle the like mental gymnastics of you know what was expected of me and would I be able to actually deliver but yeah then the games come around and I had a couple of funny little injuries going on at the time but was also just super psyched out by the whole thing mm-hmm. and then ended up winning silver in both of my events and both of my I think both of my world records or maybe just one of them were broken as well by one of my other competitors so for me like Rio was incredible in the sense that it was my first games but it was also a huge shock to the system because I was kind of like whoa like you know you're out there on one of the biggest like world stages you can be on Mm -hmm. and I had to not look too disappointed which was a really interesting thing to kind of grapple with at the time because everyone was like this is incredible and I was like but I didn't do what I wanted to do like Mm -hmm. we didn't get the result we wanted I feel like I should be both disappointed and happy at the same time so I think grappling with that (laughs) at 15 was pretty strange but you know again like we had such a fantastic team and I had such good support that it really set me up better for the following year I think I grew a lot in that time so yeah and how did you go like you just mentioned that you're you're 15 and you've come up in your first world champs 
with two world records and then you didn't quite do as well as what you hoped at the Olympics. Like how I've been one to cry after swimming events when I didn't get the time I want. How did you do that on a world stage? Like how did you hold that emotion in? (laughs) I remember it so clearly. I, I walked off the track and I was like, I was just devastated. And I was like, okay, you have to just, I just knew that I had to kind of hold it together because I didn't want to be that person who came second and was crying. I just Mm -hmm. didn't feel like that was fair. And it was a little bit of shock too, I think. And I came off the track and you kind of walk, when you walk off the track from the finish line, you walk straight into like a media sort of queue. So as soon as you get off, you start talking to people and cameras and whoever. Yeah. (laughs) And I remember I walked up to the first one, it was Channel 7, and they were like, Isis, like that was a great race. Um, How do you feel? And I was like, "Mm, okay, how do I feel? At the time, I thought that they kind of just wanted to hear what they wanted to hear. So I told them, I was like, oh, I feel great. You know, the the race wasn't um, necessarily what I expected, but it was such an awesome opportunity to be out here. And I'm so excited for my race in a few days because I think I had the 100 like two days later. And I said that a couple of times. And then I got off the track and I went and go into like this little back room. And I must have seen, it was either my coach, my parents. Oh, I was just, I was bawling my eyes out for the next like three hours. Mm. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was rough, but I think it was really important for me as well. Like it was a really good experience to kind of be like, well, this is how you deal with disappointment Mm -hmm. in elite sport. And no one can really teach you how to do that until it happens. So as intense as it was at the time, I think it was completely necessary. Yeah. And then you came back in 2017 and what did you do in 2017? Oh my God, I, like 2017 is my favourite one to talk about. <laughs> so London was 2017, London World Champs. And I was actually two weeks before we were supposed to leave for the World Champs um, in London, I was in hospital with tonsillitis. Oh no. Um, yeah, and it was pretty bad. I couldn't, I couldn't breathe, I couldn't speak, like it was intense. And my coach came to see me when I was in hospital and he was like, look, we've got London in two weeks. If you were running... For whatever reason, we weren't running heats and finals. So he was like, if you were running heats, I would have pulled you out. Mm. But because you're running two straight finals, I'll let you go. And I was like, thanks. Cool. Don't really care right now. And then we went to London and I was still trying to stay on top of it, trying not to like get sick again. And then my 200 was first. And I remember standing behind the blocks of that race. And I have never felt more relaxed in my life because I was like, I was literally in hospital two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I expect nothing from myself right now. Like I want to get through this race and just be proud that I did it. And I run that race and I I won that race (laughs) and was so shocked. (laughs) Like when I, when you watch it back, I kind of crossed the line and I remember not looking up at the board because the results come up pretty much straight away. And I had felt so good running that I didn't want to ruin the moment. And I was like, if I look up at the board and see that I didn't win the race or it was a bad race, I'm going to, I'm going to be really disappointed. So I put it off for as long as I could. And then eventually I turn around and I see the board and my name was at the top. And I was like, what? And I genuinely thought, I was like, that's a mistake. They've messed that up. And then it obviously wasn't. And I was absolutely stoked and it was the best thing ever. And then two days later we had the hundred and there was a little bit, I remember going into that a little bit kind of like, Ooh, you ran well the other day. Like you should probably run well again, but again, you were sick two weeks ago. Don't worry about it. Uh, and I ran the 100 and I broke the world record and won the race. So it was just the best. It was like the comeback story that everyone dreams of. So, yeah, it was it was pretty special. And to have done it somewhere like London with such a fantastic crowd and, like, they've got really awesome support for para-athletes over there. So, yeah, you feel pretty special. So, it was a, yeah, it was a pretty, pretty awesome time. Yeah, and I actually – I didn't see you 200, but I did see you uh, 100 – and, it, and I like I was watching it last night and you finished the race and you're like, oh, yay. And then you looked at the board and you must have seen that work, that second world <laughs> record and like the joy in your face was amazing. Yeah, oh, it was the best feeling. I mean, to this day, um, I think that'll always be like the best event that I ever do because having come off Rio and out of hospital, I just didn't expect anything. And so when when you kind of, I think, surprise yourself, that's the best feeling in sport, whether it's in training, competing, whatever it is, that is that is why we do it. Yes. Yeah. For those magical moments, and you're like, oh my gosh, it happened. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> my body's way more capable than what I thought. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. 
that was such a high in 2018 was the com games how'd you go like that's pretty much a home crowd when you it, it's in Australia how'd you go yeah. competing there Ah, oh, I loved it I mean it was I don't know I think because it was a home crowd I would kind of describe it as cozy like I think it was a really cozy event and a really nice race and having people there that I knew I had friends from primary school I had I had friends who were friends with my parents when I was born. Like I just had all these people there that have known me some like my whole life, some through really key phases of my life. And I think having those people there and sharing it with them. I remember after the race, I ran straight up to one of my training partners and I was able to give her a hug. And then I looked up the top of the stairs and I could see like five of my other friends that were all kind of standing there. And it was crazy. I mean, it felt, it was really surreal because it felt like, like a nationals or like a state champs or something because everyone you know was there yeah. and then you kind of turn around and it's like oh this is an international event and it was just it was so special so yeah I mean nothing beats the home games no I think <laughs> most athletes say that they're like it's that home games they strive for yeah definitely did you make the decision like before you competed at the com games to step back for, and focus on school or did you make it after you competed like when did that come about Yeah, so initially the plan to take 2019 off was sort of up in the air. We knew that I really wanted to commit to year 12, which would either mean less training or no training at all. But I think around the time of Com Games, mentally I was, I don't know, I was pretty fatigued and I was at a point where I was like, I'm not loving this as much as I should. And I think as soon as I started to feel like that, I remember I actually got back to my my room in the village after my race for Com Games and I kind of sat there and I was alone and I had my medal with me and it's like a little box and I kind of looked at it and I was like, this is so special and I feel like I should feel so much more satisfaction and pride and excitement about this and I, I don't. And so I think that for me was like a huge, almost red flag um I also kind of felt like you know all my friends are out here about to turn 18 going out having a good time you know what if I'm missing out what if I want to just be like a normal kid that can do whatever I want and not have to worry about getting injured or something so yeah I think that was when after com games I was like you know what I think I need the rest of this year as well so that was why I kind of decided to take 2018 and do all the stuff I hadn't been able to do, which turns out it actually wasn't, there wasn't that much stuff and it (laughs) wasn't as exciting being a normal teenager as you would think. (laughs) I like that. I like that you were able to sit there and reflect at such a young age and go, "Mm, it's not quite as special as what I should feel and let's take a little break and refresh and then you found your love again and that's, I think that's what it's about is like knowing when to step back, focus on something else and then find your love back in the sport again. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, if you're not doing it because you love it, then you need to either think about why you're doing it or find what it is that makes you excited and Mm -hmm. like makes you want to get up in the morning and go to training every day at six for the rest of your life. You know, like if, if you don't have that, that joy and that passion for it, then I don't know, it doesn't really deserve the time. I don't think. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And is there any other like significant milestones along your journey that we haven't talked about so far? (laughs) No, I think in terms of athletics, yeah, look, I think the world records are still (laughs) my favourite little milestone, particularly the ones in London. They were the best. Yeah, I guess the rest are all like pretty, pretty normal stuff. Like I graduated high school, got into uni, got my driver's licence. That was exciting. (laughs) (laughs) Just like normal, normal stuff. But um, I guess like another milestone could be moving up here. That was pretty big, moving to Brizzy. We, like I said, I wasn't really planning on moving up here. And when I started working with the coach I have now, um, Paul Pierce, I knew I wanted to work with him. I also knew he was based in Brisbane. And my two non-negotiables were, I want to work with Paul and I don't want to move. <laughs> uh-huh. So yeah, initially I was planning on sort of commuting up and back like month by month. And then obviously with COVID and everything that happened, it was just easier to kind of come up for a block. And then I ended up staying and um, I've never moved house before. So moving not only for the first time interstate or at all was a pretty huge thing, but so was, I guess, essentially moving for my sport. Yeah, I guess that that would be another one. Yeah. And in such an uncertain time, like at the stage where you were moving 
Melbourne wasn't in a very good place. So you might not have known when you were able to come back down and all that uncertainty. Yeah, exactly. And when I left, it was just me. So my dad was in Melbourne for a few months and I was living up here with some housemates and my mum, New South Wales. So we were kind of all separated across different states for ages and there was no guarantee as to when we'd see each other again. Luckily, dad managed to come up over Christmas for a bit. But yeah, we were constantly dodging like restrictions and border closures and whatever. So yeah, it was a pretty, pretty crazy time, actually. Yeah. And that's being said, we're, like we're in one of the luckiest countries in the world. Like that's from Australia's yeah. point of view. So imagine like athletes going through that kind of move in a less fortunate country. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I couldn't imagine how they kind of navigated that. So <laughs> very, very crazy. So we've gone through a lot of the journey and you've already discussed some of the benefits, but is there a benefit that participating in sport has provided you that's like transferred over to other avenues of your life? Yes, absolutely. This is, I love this question. (laughs) I think for me, one of the biggest things was, I mean, I feel like I had to grow up pretty quickly through all of that. You kind of, when you're on a team for these international events you're you're treated like an adult you're expected to be places on time you're expected to have everything you need with you you're expected to know what you're doing and be able to do it without too much help obviously people will help you if you need it but you have to be quite independent and I remember finding it so frustrating when I was between the ages of maybe 15 and 18 going away on these trips and being treated like an adult and then coming back and having teachers telling us to remember to bring our homework or like don't forget to do this quiz and then hand it in and check with them like I I hated that because I was like I'm so capable of just doing this so I think for me sport was really important for teaching me to have a really good work ethic but also to learn how to prioritize what's important and understand I guess you know why why you're doing it and sometimes you have to you know let other things go in order to keep yourself happy and healthy and I think that was a really big thing for me. I also think it might come with the nature of your sport too, but I'm quite a perfectionist. (laughs) So for me, like doing things well and doing things right the first time is obviously not always possible, but like it's kind of important to me. So Mm -hmm. I think that kind of translated across into my studies quite a bit. Once I'd been training for a while and I knew what it meant to put in, you know, hard work and really commit to something, by the time I got to year 12, I was like, right, this is my training program. I will be studying every day for this long. Um, These are my breaks. (laughs) Yeah. So I don't know. I think once the athlete's in you, it's very hard to take it out again. I agree. Um, I don't know if you listened to the chat with my high school teacher, Nigel Knighton, but I used to try and PB in my, in my sacks and assignments. (laughs) And so like, that hit me pretty hard it come March and I'd hit a hundred percent in multiple subjects. And I was like, Oh no, nowhere to go from here. Nowhere to go. Oh my God. That's so relatable. <laughs> yeah. I, I did a similar thing. Like we always have this thing with, you know, once you've got a PB, it's okay to, to stay there. It's okay mm-hmm. to be consistent, but it's not okay to drop down. You want mm-hmm. to either be consistent or going up. Yeah. I did the same thing with my grades in year 12. I was like, I want every sack to be at or above 80 mm-hmm. and anything below that it's all over. (laughs) So yeah, I did pretty much the same thing. It's effective if you've got the time to really commit to it. (laughs) Oh, and like, I even remember back, I can't remember which subject it was, but one teacher called me into their office and had to tell me, they're like, Fiona, we're really sorry. You got an 82% on this. And they were expecting me, like they told me my results separately to everyone else because they were expecting a meltdown. (laughs) (laughs) That's so funny. (laughs) Yeah. So like, I totally resonate with that mindset and it probably is an athletic, like an athlete mindset or a, someone who's ultra competitive, maybe with themselves, like in an individual sport, that's probably where it came from. Yeah, absolutely. But no, I really like those benefits and they do transfer over, even if you don't mean for them to. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think too, like when you train with people like that and you learn to be like, obviously when you're training really hard, I actually think it's quite a vulnerable place to be. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it hurts and it's intense and you're kind of asking yourself to do things that you've never done before. So, you know, the people that you're sharing those experiences with, whether it be your training partners or your coach, like it teaches you how to, I think, be with people when things are uncomfortable and how to communicate how you're feeling and to be confident in kind of what you're doing what you're saying and I think that 
was a really big thing too. Like you learn to accept the way things are and talk to people about it. And yeah, there's nowhere to hide when you're, you know, five reps deep in a lactic session and you just like you just want to throw up (laughs) yeah yeah exactly it's yeah it's a really weird place to be that I don't think many people who aren't training would really understand Mm. and I think you bond quite deep with your training partners or your coach or whoever's around while you're in that vulnerable state because you're all sharing that intense experience together yeah absolutely I think that's I love that about that little team environment that you've got like obviously they're all there to sort of be like yay like run faster but you're also there to be like oh you all right Mm -hmm. (laughs) that sucks like those reps are hard and yeah I think that's that's pretty great too yeah and you are quite young already but I think you're quite wise beyond your years is there a lesson you've learned along the way that you like to share yes I also love this question (laughs) so I think this one took me a little while to I think, accept, but it's actually on my lock screen of my phone. And it says, it's a quote that says progress over perfection. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I think it can apply to anybody, which is why I like it. It's not athlete specific at all. But I think for those of us who get really caught up in wanting to do everything perfectly, which of course, I think every athlete knows what that's like, wanting Mm -hmm. to just be like perfect and not get anything wrong. But also for students going through high school and for anyone who's passionate about something, and really sort of mastering what they do. I think that's just that reminder that any step forward is still a step forward. And, you know, you can't be the best at something within a day or a week. Like I think it's like 10,000 hours or something where people say yep. it takes to really be good at something. So I find that really helpful if I've had like a bad day at training or if I'm really stressed about uni or whatever it might be, or if I'm not sure what to kind of put my attention to just to sort of remind myself that you know so long as you're moving forward and you're you know taking care of yourself and really looking at working on what you need to work on right now in this moment then everything will kind of be okay in the end yeah and I think that's such a beautiful lesson and valuable for everyone not just in the sporting or fitness sense but you know, in your everyday study sense, or even like I do that at work. I know I like to be a perfectionist and if something doesn't go my way, I'm kind of like, oh, that's not the way I wanted it to happen. Whereas people are like, oh, yeah. Fiona, like that worked out great. I'm like, no, this, this, and this were wrong. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah. Like accepting that, you know, well, no, it still worked out okay. And it was better than last time. So we're still moving forward. We're still growing or we're still doing this. Then Yeah, like that's progress over perfection. That's amazing. I like that. It's a good one. Hey, I like that one too. Yeah, you've Um, done well. Thank you. (laughs) Have you been involved in a project where sport has been used as a tool to develop the community? I think indirectly, definitely. I think for me, sport has been a really cool way to kind of, I think because I'm mostly in like a Paralympic para kind of side of sport, awareness and sort of understanding of what we actually do as as para athletes and Paralympians it's kind of hard to explain to somebody who's never been exposed to it so for me both as a new athlete kind of starting out when I was 14 sport was the reason I understood what the Paralympics were sport was the under like the reason I understood how different people kind of worked and functioned and how different disabilities and abilities affect people and Mm -hmm. I think for me that was, it was pretty special because I could actually found people I could identify with on a pretty deep level, but also in the sense of just kind of opening your mind up a little bit to the world and what actually goes on. Like obviously the Olympics are incredible and it's amazing to see such, you know, insane like sporting ability, but, you know, likewise with the Paralympics, I think, you know, it's slowly gaining more recognition through the community that is sport and through like talent search days and inclusive programs and, awards nights that recognize athletes para athletes in their own category all that kind of stuff really helps to sort of bring everybody together a little bit more I think which I love like the con games was like that you had we essentially had an olympic paralympic combined team which is crazy to me you know like I'd never sat in a dining hall with olympians and paralympians and felt like we were the same thing yep I like that you mentioned that I think you guys you know you wouldn't sit next to an 800 meet a runner and go well we're not the same thing like you are all the same and you're one team and you're all representing your country and I think 
the fact that times are kind of changing and opinions are are being more inclusive I think that's amazing yeah definitely and I think it's really cool to be a part of that and actually see it happening um like I said London uh, and the UK was really great for that because I saw what it looked like to have um a world championships where the crowd knew what was going on they knew who you were and they knew what you were doing and they really cared and I think that's one of the things I really like about sport it actually gives you a space to be very confident and to really believe in yourself and believe in what you do and I think as someone who's like naturally quite introverted anyway whenever I get onto the track I'm like a completely different person so I don't know I think sport's great for that it really empowers people yeah and it's funny you almost have um like a different sporting persona. I know I'm the same around the pool. Like normally I'll be that person in the corner of a party and I won't speak to anyone or I'll sit at the dinner table and I'll say maybe five words to two people. But like when I'm on the pool, I will be the loudest person there and I will wear a pink tutu similar to your pink socks. And that's just the way it is. Like no one can help that. Yeah. So it does really give you a confidence and a place to be confident. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now I also watched a, um, I think it was like a campaign video with Beyond Blue that you were in. Mm. You were talking about like mental health with youth and like advocating and how sport was, you know, really helping you reach out for help if you needed it. Did you find Mm. participating in that was really helpful? Absolutely. I think mental health for anybody, whether it be athletes, students, kids, adults, anyone, is something that I'm really passionate about. I'm doing psych at uni as well, so it's my whole life. Um, (laughs) But, yeah, I think working with Beyond Blue and I guess being able to have a chat about what mental health means to athletes especially was pretty important. I know I come from a background where, you know, talking about how you're feeling and what's going on and reaching out for help is quite acceptable um Mm -hmm. I've spoken to so many sports psychs and clinical psychs over the years but you know for some people it's not like that and Mm -hmm. I think when you're put in a position where you're expected to be perhaps like the best in Australia or the best in the world the notion that there could be something wrong or going on or something you're not sure about is it kind of doesn't line up so Mm -hmm. I think it can be hard to sort of wrap your head around that And the reason I participated in the little project with Beyond Blue was because it came, I think, not long after I took a step back. Mm -hmm. Um, And I remember thinking about that thought process that I was having at Com Games where I was like, this is the best thing in the world and I'm just not feeling it. That was like a real sort of mental game for me. So I imagine I'm not the only person that's been there. I know a lot of athletes that have retired and come back or taken a break or not taken a break and then never come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think it's important to be able to chat about those things and accept that, you know, we're not, as athletes, we're not, you know, machines that can just keep churning out time for the rest of our life, but also just that we're all human and we all experience things differently and being able to talk about that just makes it a bit easier. Yeah, and, like, you were going through all of this whilst being a very vulnerable teenage girl, like, not as in your you are vulnerable, but it's a very vulnerable time of a girl's life. <laughs> Yeah. And um, I look back at my teen years and I'm thinking, oh gosh, what a roller coaster. But the thoughts and the feelings and even just the hormones going through your body, like a lot changes in someone's headspace in that time. And you're not only doing that, but you're competing and representing your country. And you, you know, you were the best in the world. You had a world record, like doing all that all at once. Like that's a lot. Yeah, it's funny. I think that never really changes you kind of think it does and it it doesn't like I know when I was growing up and I was in those like awkward kind of teen years Mm -hmm. obviously there was a lot going on but because there was so much you sort of don't focus in on any one thing and then I noticed when I came back so even more recently there's a lot of dialogue around how athletes look and perform and I think for female athletes in particular like that's a pretty poignant thing you know like you're all kind of aware of how strong you are and how fast you're running and I've had a lot of chats with, you know, sports psychs and even my nutritionist about what it means to be physically fit and Mm -hmm. what that looks like and how different that is for everybody. And I think for a lot of people, particularly in sports where your body is on show Mm -hmm. all the time, it's, yeah, it's hard not to get caught up in what the perfect athlete looks like. So 
I think that's been a really big thing for me too ever since I was like 14 all the way through to now is like understanding what strength is and what that is for you so Mm -hmm. yeah I think any conversation around what is normal is super important yeah and like you've mentioned what strength looks like it looks different for a runner than what it does for a swimmer than what it does for a rugby player like it's all different depending on your sport or even you know sprinters versus marathon runners like their natural shape or ideal with quotation mark shape is going to be different as well so like learning not to compare that and compare how you know you feel and what you are I remember a coach once said to me that I was too small (laughs) to be a a certain type of swimmer and I was like well what do you mean like I'll just do whatever I want yeah 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 like I can resonate being on show like I was in my bathers (laughs) a lot of my teen years and I guess there is a benefit and you kind of are forced to learn body confidence a little bit earlier yeah. or yeah I would say so I think it's I think it's funny what you said about the coach that you had because I think we've all been there where a coach has kind of said something offhandedly and you've gone oh mm. hang on what like what does that mean mm. or like you know do you not think I'm capable of doing this or whatever so I think yeah I think for anyone who's involved in sport like at the end of the day it's there to make you feel good like mm-hmm it's there because the endorphins are great and it's just a super fun place to be. And I think the second that other things sort of start creeping in, I think it's just another one of those situations where you bring yourself back to why you're doing it and what you're doing it for. And I resonate too with being like a small athlete. So yeah, yeah, strength looks different on different people. But at the end of the day, if you're running fast, actually my gym coach said this to me a few weeks ago and it was the best thing I'd ever heard. And he was kind of commenting on how with all the training I've been doing, I look different to how I did when I started. He's like, you're looking super strong. And then I went, oh, you know, thanks. And then he turned around and he went, but like at the end of the day, who cares what you look like as long as you're running fast? Mm -hmm. And I was like, that is it. That's exactly what I think everyone needs to hear at some point, ideally early on in their like sporting journey, because that even now makes such a huge difference in how I think about how I train and why I do it. Mm -hmm. And even on a life journey, it's like, well, who cares if you, what you look like as long as you're healthy? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I so, love that message. I think uh, that might be a quote for you. <laughs> oh, I know. Thanks, Chris. We'll write that one down. <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> so where do you see the future of sport? Oh, I'm so excited for the future of sport. I think I think there's been a lot going on with, I mean, obviously, personally, like para sport is pretty close to my heart. And I would love for Australia to, I don't know, embrace it the same way I've seen other countries do it. I think already we're on a really good path in that direction. And if anything, it's just a matter of getting more exposure and more understanding. I mean, you have people like Dylan Alcott who are already out there doing amazing things and like Kurt Fernley and people like that who are making disability something very sort of visible and easy to consume and understand, which I love. But I also just think that sport the more we talk about it the more people realize how fantastic it is we have heaps of women in sport at the moment which I love and I love that people really get around that people like Ellie Cole who I see all the time I guess sort of promoting sport for women and girls I love so I hope that soon we'll have an overwhelming number of young women just absolutely dominating the records (laughs) but yeah it's exciting I mean sport is just about I don't know, getting faster, throwing things further, whatever it might be. And I think people will genuinely continue to do that for a very long time. So, I mean, for as long as it's encouraging inclusion and participation, I'm all for it. Yeah, I like that. And I guess the encouragement of that inclusion and participation means that more people get to feel those benefits of sport and they get to experience, you know, the life lessons and the the learning curves that, you know, me and you have been through and, mm they get to learn from it and they get to grow from it. And I think that's so special, you know, it's such a powerful tool in someone's life and they can, I've seen people turn their lives around through just participating in sport. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it can be a pretty intimidating thing to want to get into. I mean, you think about sport and you kind of go straight to the sporting greats or even for like kids in high school, you think about sport and you think about that one kid in your class who 
can run really fast or swim really fast or do whatever it is really well and you kind of go oh that's not me Mm. and I was that person I genuinely until I was 14 was like sport's not my thing I'm not really into it never going to be I hate running (laughs) I was one of those people but then the second somebody actually offered me a place to give it a go a very safe space to kind of give it a go I was all for it so I think it's more about like getting people involved but also like letting people know that it's not as scary as it looks Mm. and you don't have to be that kid in that class to be a part of it Mm -hmm. um, at all and I like that you know you say safe place because that's where I really found my love for the pool and for swimming was that that became my safe place going through the fun things that girls do in high school or or boys go through in high school like just people go through in that awkward phase of their life and yeah like it really does give you that place to grow and as you were I was not the sporty kid I was um running away from balls and forgetting my gym yeah. uniform so I didn't have to participate and I don't know what I faked to get out of running yeah. cross country oh yes <laughs> yep <laughs> but yeah it was you know same thing as you Some, someone gave you a chance and you know you found that safe place and you're like oh like this actually isn't too bad I do like this Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I still find that. I think I said that to someone the other week. They were like, oh, how are you finding the training? Like you're training all the time. And I was like, yeah, it's the best hour, two hours of my day, like every day. And I mean, it is what you make it. And I think once you understand what it is that you love about it, you can just kind of cultivate this really awesome environment, which is exactly what I did after I came back. And, you know, sport should be that. It shouldn't be a chore or something that's scary or painful all the time it should be something that you do because you love it and it really adds value to your life. Oh, I love that. That's so amazing. (laughs) You've made the team for Tokyo. So that's what's next for you personally. Are you really excited even though it's a year delayed? Like how are you feeling leading up to the games? Yeah, I think it's it's funny. I'd love to like just say, yep, super keen, going to run fast, going to be great. I think along with the excitement, there's a little bit of apprehension too. You know, you kind of go into these events thinking, is a big deal so I think it'll take a bit of work over the next couple of months to kind of yeah really get my my head in the right place and really be mentally prepared I know that physically my coach is doing all the amazing wonderful things that he knows how to do to get me physically there Mm -hmm. um so I'm not worried about that I'm excited to run fast and be strong but yeah it's it's an exciting couple of months but it's pretty crazy that it's actually coming around quick now um yeah yeah. So, I mean, for me, that year off that we had because of COVID actually worked quite well in my favour. just gave me a little bit more time. But yeah, now they're very quickly approaching. So it's exciting. It is. But it's, yeah, it can also be a bit daunting at the same time. Yeah. And I'm very excited now to watch you, watch you run. And I hope that you finish a race and don't look at the scoreboard because you've just had <laughs> such a good run that you don't want to look up. But I, I hope it is a good result for you. But more oh, importantly, I, I hope that. you have fun. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's the, that's the best thing anyone said before a race, I reckon. Oh, well, hope, listen you. back to this in the in the marshalling. Oh my god, I so will bring my headphones. <laughs> well, thank you so so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been good fun. Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. This is a completely independent podcast that has been created to share the journey and lessons of top level sporting professionals, but also your everyday lover of sport. If you liked this podcast, I'd really appreciate if you could leave a review and share it with someone who you think would also enjoy it. Until next time.